Good morning, Wellspring. It's so good to see you folks here today. And uh, we're here t- for one purpose, that is to magnify the Lord God Almighty. So let's stand up this morning and, uh, and worship him. Sing this out. Joyful, joyful. so grateful for the the gift of uh, freedom that we have in you, that you're the one who takes all our sins away, God, that you covered our sins at the cross, and that we can stand righteous before you today, God. We have so much to thank you for, so much to celebrate today. So, God, pull our hearts together, unite us as we lift up the name of Jesus Christ today. You're an awesome God and worthy to be praised. You're great and glorious. And so we worship you today, God. We ask that you come into this place, that you fill this place and fill our lives with your goodness today. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Why don't you take just a moment and greet somebody near you uh, that you maybe haven't talked to this morning. Let's stand up as we continue worshiping our God this morning. There's no other name given to men whereby we might be saved. In the name of Jesus. Let's sing about him today. There's no other name given to men whereby we might be saved. 
teach you a new song this morning. It talks about uh, that God is the only king forever. And first of all, out of Psalm 25, it says, may we shout for joy when we hear of your victory and raise a victory banner in the name of the Lord our God. May the Lord answer all your prayers. And then Romans 11:36 and 1 Timothy 1:17 both say, Everyone, everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory, everything, all glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Say that together. He alone is God. He alone is God. Amen. One more time. He alone is God. Amen. Kings come and kings go, only raised up by God's hand and taken out by God's hand. But God is the only eternal king. And it looks like Don wants some kids, so let's send kids that way as we're singing here. Kids, go ahead and head out that way. So we're going to sing this, and then uh, you can join in. It goes like this. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Got it? Sing that with me. You are the only king forever. 
Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. The verse goes like this. Our God, the firm foundation. Nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong now shaken, but we trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. all your wisdom sing it out unmatched in all your wisdom in love and justice you will reign every knee will bow we bring our expectations our hope is anchored in your name the name of Jesus Victorious, you are the only king forever. Forever, God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. We lift your banner high, we lift it up. We lift up. We lift the name of Jesus from age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus from age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you high. King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. you are the mighty God, victorious. You're the only king for uh, through all of eternity, the one who was and is and is to come. God, may we come before your throne today and bow before you now. Lord, we know your word says that someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But we come today, Lord. We come today. God, may we humble ourselves so that we might not have to be humbled under the mighty hand of the God, the, the everlasting God. Lord, we come before you today fearing you and loving you at the same time. God, you are the mighty God. We're so thankful, Lord, that there's nothing in this universe, in all of existence, that ever happens without first passing through your watchful eye, your loving heart, God. So I pray for every life in here today and those watching online. God, may you just minister to hearts right where each person is. May you provide for every need as we just worship you today.
We love you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing the sound. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him for Lord, we do praise you today. Uh, God, we come before you a grateful people for all that you have done. God, I pray today if there's anyone here who doesn't see your loving heart, that they'll see it today. Even as we worship you, God, as, even as we open up your, your word, God, your, your gentle care of us is amazing. It's amazing, God. Just spend a moment telling him this morning how much you love him. Worshiping him, praising him. Lord, we do love you this morning, and we just uh, lift up our praise to you. God, may you open up our hearts and open up the uh, uh, 
our mind's eye, God, to see and understand your word. Only your spirit can do that, Lord. And I just ask that you would do that this morning in amazing ways and that we would just follow your word, not just be hearers, God, but you would show us how to live it out day to day in very practical ways. And we pray this in the precious and mighty and powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. 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 You can be seated. Thank you, Stan and worship team. I didn't send you my notes, so how did you know to write all those, put in all those songs about Jesus' name? <laughs> the Lord knew. The Lord knows. And we are going to be talking, uh, that's going to come up in our lesson today, a little bit talking about uh, the name of Jesus and what, and what a wonderful name it is and what has been accomplished through his name. So Good morning. We're glad that you are here. Online viewers, we're glad that you're here with us also. We are going to be in 3 John. Not John 3, but 3 John, the letter of. Make sure we clarify that. So we went through here in the last couple uh, weeks, months, we've been, we, went through the, we went through 1 John. Uh, that kind of led naturally into 2 John. And so we thought to ourselves as a teaching team, whatever should we do next? And we decided we would do... Third John, it just kind of seemed to flow. You know, as we've been coming through this, we've been getting a glimpse of what what was going on in that first century church, in that early church. You know, we go and we read and we do studies in the book of Acts, and we we get an idea of of what was going on in that first century. Um, We understand maybe what some of the the greatest strengths that the church had in the first century, and we look at some of what are the the largest areas for, for room for improvement. We don't like to use the word weakness. So we had room for improvement in that first century church. When their elders got together, what did they, what did they pray for? What did, what, did they, what did they realize was the greatest struggles? And, and what were they praying for God to do in their midst? What was going well and, and what were struggles that had room for improvement? So today we're going to get another opportunity to look into that first century church through the eyes, or maybe more directly through the pen of John, as the Holy Spirit of God worked through him to write this letter. Uh, Let's open with prayer. Father God, as we come to your word and as we open it, Lord, we want to see it for what it is, the living application that it can have for us, that it may have been written long ago, but it has no less power or authority today in our lives. So Father God, as we open your word, as we study, we just ask that you'll open our eyes and our ears and our hearts spiritually to hear your message and that we would discern from it how we ought to live our lives and improve what we do to the glory of your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me ask you a little bit about your identity. Everybody here, I'm not just talking like when the officer stops you on a traffic stop and says, you know, now you see your identification. But we have a confusion in the world today about identity. Everybody seems to be uh, asking about, you know, who they are or, or what they are, and people are lost in identity. And so we also have an identity. As we go out and we carry on our lives in the world around us, people look at us and they identify us with something. And so I want to talk a little bit about that and how our identity might change as we go through our lives. It's not so important the person that you were, especially as we talk about our walk with the Lord, our spiritual walk. It's more important the person that you are now, or maybe even the person that you want to become, because we understand in this walk with the Lord that we are moving towards something, and we should be moving toward Christ's likeness, and that's the direction we want to go. Now, I, I, I love it when I get some visitors that come from my old church down in Tri-City where I, where I first started attending church, little, little Craig. And uh, mom took little Craig to church, and, and Craig loved going to church, and he loved mommy, and he loved building those little crafts that we would do in church. Remember the one where you take the matchsticks, and you had all the burned-out matchsticks, and you'd glue them to a little wooden cross and make that pretty little wooden cross of, of burnt matches? Craig loved doing, little Craig loved doing that stuff. I remember uh, Craig as he grew up a little bit older, and uh, sometimes he would sit uh, through the sermon with mom, and uh, I remember him doing that, and so I was still going to church. I still love my mommy, uh, although I might sneak out of the house every once in a while as I got a little bit older. I remember one time after church, the pastor, and I was walking out, and he was standing there by the door shaking people's hands, and he came to little Craig, and he said, Craig, what'd you think of the sermon? And in all honesty of youth, I said, I thought it was boring.
If you want to see mom with a horrified look on her face, <laughs> say something like that in front of the pastor. So I still enjoyed going to church, and, um, <laughs> and I wasn't necessarily obeying mom all the time. Apparently, I hadn't lost my infatuation with matches. Um, I managed to burn down the neighbor's pasture one time as we were playing with, with matches out there. I remember as Craig got a little bit older, and he decided that he didn't have to go to church anymore. It was his choice. Uh, and older Craig decided that uh, there were fun things to do out in the world. He called up mom every once in a while if there was a need that would arise. And uh, an older Craig decided that uh, he would get right with God later when, there was, when it was time because church is for old people, right? That was the philosophy I had. And so I figured, well, I'll go out and have my fun in the world and then when it's time, I'll, I'll get right with God. Well, God had a different plan for me. Um, as I was going through those days, I imagine you know, the people that were friends of mine, if, they, if you asked them about my identity, they would tell you that you know, I was a good man they might or might not tell you that I was a Christian, and they would definitely not tell you that I was walking with the Lord. God decided to take my mom and then my father at a young age, and I realized that I was living an arrogant life, thinking that maybe someday I might have an opportunity to get right with God. Tomorrow was never promised. Here's the interesting thing about our identity. It can change. It can change, and you can be a part of making that decision to change your life. You know, I talked about following the Lord. I mean, in those earlier days, I was following Jesus. I mean, I went to church, said the prayer, right? Okay. I was following Jesus in those earlier days, but he was way out there. I could just barely see him every once in a while. I certainly wasn't walking close to him. I certainly wasn't walking close enough to him that when I stumbled that I could fall and catch him and fall on Jesus. And I realized as I got a little bit older and how precious and how fragile life is, that I needed to be close enough to Jesus that when I stumbled, I could cling to him. And I started to change my life. Some people make that choice, as Paul said, to run the race. For some people, it seems that that race is, uh, is very easy to run. For some people, it seems to be a struggle. Some people don't bother to try at all. If you've been following Jesus for a little while, you'd probably agree with me that it is not easy to be a follower of Jesus Christ, especially a public one where people would look at you and go, oh, look, there's a Christian. Well, that one there, yeah, yep, uh, they followed Jesus. It's not easy to be that person in the world that we live in. It's hard to be consistent. It's hard to follow Jesus with every footstep that we take. And it's a changing world. The values of the world are changing constantly. In a world of constant change, who can you really trust? There's some great verses that we can rely on. Malachi in 3.6, 3, uh, 3, he said, For I, this is God speaking, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. God doesn't change. In a world that's constantly changing, as our identities change, as our nations change, as our cultures change, God stays the same. In Hebrews 13.8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Anybody ever experienced change? Has it been simple? Have you ever had change that just went, seemed to go very easily? Now, change is always hard because you're forming something. You're changing something from one thing to another. God is changing us, but God does not change. And so he becomes that one, that one element, that one person, that, that one thing that we can just grab onto and lock onto because as we might struggle, God does not change. So the times may change and people change, but people struggling to do the right thing, that doesn't change. It's the same today as it was a thousand years ago. And this is one of the greatest anchors that we have to our soul. As you're struggling in a world that changes. I mean, for crying out loud, when we started off, I mean, I'm thinking about my generation, we started off with rotary telephones. We got kids today that have no idea what a rotary telephone is. We've got people in this church listening to this message that remember a day when, when the telephone didn't even live in the house. Now we've got one packing around in my, in my pocket. Things change. As this world spins out of control, the one thing that we can trust on that doesn't change is God. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. 
trust in God. As, our, as the values of our nation change, as the values of our cultures change, as the values of the world change, as everything spirals and changes, trust in God. Lean on God. He says, lean not on your own understanding. We've become so wise, so intelligent, so, so scientifically advanced in the day that we live in. We need to lean not on our own understanding. He says, but lean on God. He says, in that way, he will make all of our paths straight. One of the ways that we can trust in God is to trust in his word. You have a Bible? I'm hoping you brought one today. It might be on that telephone that I was talking about that was in your pocket. If you want to bring that out, that's fine. I don't care how you approach God's word, but I'd love to have you open it and go to 3 John with me. So one of the ways, again, is that we have God's word that we can trust. And to that end, God expects for us to be studying his word. It's a, it, it, the whole purpose of God's word was to give us instruction, to give us examples, both good and bad, on how we ought to live out our lives. It's an instruction manual for life. One of the examples that we're going to be talking about today is a person named John. We've introduced him several times in the last several passages. But this is a guy that learned from Jesus, walked with Jesus, and learned firsthand from the things that Jesus was doing. John wrote his first presentation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then he wrote the book letter of 1 John then 2 John, then 3 John, and finally he wrote the book of Revelation. And all of these were written back around 80, 90, 95 or so, when John was an old man, toward the ending of his life. He felt in those last days that the Spirit was working through him to get this message out for them in their day and for us. So now we come to this final letter, the final epistle, this letter of, of, of John. As with the previous letters, we have to decide what the Holy Spirit wants for us to learn from God's Word today. We might be able to discern some of what it meant to the hearers of the word, the readers of it in its day, but it still has great value for us today. And so I want us to think about this in a term of, okay, we can maybe perceive what it meant, but what does it mean to us? What are we going to do with it today? When this lesson is done and church is over and you leave out of here to go over to the grocery store and have third service as we do shopping... I don't know how many of you I run into at the store over there. If I get five of you on the same aisle, I'm passing a plate. What, do, what are we going to do with God's word outside of these walls? So I want us to, to really turn in your ear to that, to the application of this. How is this going to change us? In the first letter that John wrote, it really wasn't intended for a specific person. It was written to the church at large, to believers, and John was warning us to watch out for false teachers. And he was talking to us about living in brotherly love, and he was inviting us and instructing us on how that walk ought to look as we follow Jesus Christ. In the second letter, uh, he wrote to a, either a specific person or maybe a specific church. But again, he was warning them uh, about these false teachers that have gone into the world. He told us in 2 John, he said, these false teachers that might come into your community, into your town, don't invite them into your homes. Don't extend hospitality to, to liars and to false truths. And if we come into 3 John, though, he's going to have a different message for us. And let's see what we can, if, we, uh, if we can bring that out. So John is going to, has written this letter, if you're looking at it there, uh, in the very first part, we re read that this was written to a man named Gaius. Well, actually, he's going to write this to three, he's going to mention three people. And we're going to look at these three men that are mentioned in this book, Gaius, uh, Diotrephus, and Demetrius, and we're going to look at the character of these people. I want us to look at their character and, and what John wrote to them and, and how that might affect our personal walk with the Lord. Are they positive role models or are they negative role models? Anybody ever have a positive role model in your life? That person that aspired you to do better, and you said, yeah, I want to be like that person. Anybody have a negative role model where you said, what that person is doing, I want none of. Negative role models can, be, can, can have a powerful impact on the person that we are and the person that we become. I apologize for the water, but I am very dehydrated. Okay, so from God's word, let's take a look at maybe some of the things we ought to and ought not to have in our lives. So let's go to 3 John, and we're going to read the first eight verses together. Well, I'll be reading. You just follow along. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, 
and they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men, so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. Right? I mean, this guy seems like a pretty good guy, right? Positive role model, perhaps. John says he had a good reputation. It says that he walked in truth. He said that John had great joy uh, because of what he was living, uh, how he was living out his life in faithfulness that he was hospitable toward all, and that he was supporting people that went out and shared the gospel. So Gaius is an example of a guy that was doing it right. And this is the cool thing, John says, it wasn't just in what John saw, but he says, others are telling me about you, Gaius, and they're saying that they see your identity and recognize what you are doing, that you are a good man, if you will, living out these things, walking the right way. Jesus had long ago said that I am the truth, the light, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. I see Gaius as one of those guys that really got that. Jesus said that I am the way, okay, but not only just the way to salvation, not only is he the only source of forgiveness for our sins, but that also he was the way in which we ought to walk our lives. Jesus was the example of how walking rightly before the Lord is done. If you want to be a follower of Christ, then our lives ought to look something like the lives that, life that Jesus lived, and our walk ought to look something like the walk that he had. He gave us an example of our daily lives and how they ought to be. So our point from this is to consider Gaius, a man who was loved by John. And John, I mean, he's this, I mean if, you want to have, if you want John to get sing, to sing praises, imagine this. John writes a letter. The Apostle John, the guy that was walking with Jesus, talked with Jesus, was there through Jesus' life, and he writes a letter about you and says, man, when I hear the good things that you're doing, it brings me great joy. I'd like to receive that letter. Yeah, I'd like to have that in my, in my resume. I'd like, I'd like to have that affirmation from somebody like that saying that I am doing well. And he says, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. John loved the fact, and we could, all, we could maybe even make the assumption that, that this Gaius was somebody that John had personally worked with because his children. He says, I have great joy in seeing that you are doing well. Parents, when our kids are doing well, does it not bring us great joy? When somebody comes to you and says, man, you know what? I was interacting with your kid the other day. What a good kid. Does that make you joyful? Does that make you happy? Maybe a little pride there? Versus, hey, can I talk to you about your kid? <laughs> okay, can, I, can I take just a moment of your time? No, John says, I, I have great joy, guys, because people are telling me that you are doing it well and you're doing it right. Our example from this is to look at what what it was, what was John doing that, I'm sorry, what was Gaius doing that John felt was so commendable that he wanted to write this letter to him and say that you were doing these things so well? Well, specifically, John commends him for his hospitality of the workers going into the field, both brethren and strangers. Now, remember back in 2 John, the letter of 2 John, the instruction there was not to be hospitable, not to extend courtesies to these liars and sharers of falsehoods that come into our communities or might try to come into our home. John now adds on to that, that although that, that is true, when somebody in comes into our town, into our homes, that we are to extend hospitality to one such as this. And he commends Gaius for doing just that. If it's a share of the lies, then be gone with them. If it's a share of the truth, we welcome them in for the work that they are doing. He says that he's doing this for brethren, those are from the local church. He says they're doing it for strangers, those who were previously unknown but are coming in and speaking the truth of God's word. Avoid the liars, love the sharers of God's word. We need to be discerning as to who these people are. How are you gonna know? You, know, you gotta go back to the truth. It's not the truth of the guy standing up here on the stage, it's the truth that you hold in your hands or you look up on your smartphone. Regardless of how you approach it or where you get it from, God's word is the truth. And so we test all things by that. Gaius was one of those guys in your church that has an open home policy. If a local missionary were to come here on leave, it'd be that guy that you knew was going to find a room in his house to put him and his family up. If a traveling speaker came to town to make a presentation, Gaius was that guy that's going to help support that. He was a guy that's going to help organize that. Gaius, like I said, was a man that had very much an open home policy to those that were working in the field, providing housing, providing food, providing finances, whatever he had. Gaius was the kind of guy that was going to help make this person comfortable. Gaius was one of those guys who lived out 
the teaching that we have here. I'm just going to give it to you, but I think it might even be up here. Um, Peter 4.9. Peter said, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Show hospitality without grumbling. Showing hospitality means you know, opening up your homes, opening up your lives, opening up the opportunity to serve these people. He says, but do it without grumbling. And that makes it a little harder. You know, if I told you that we had somebody coming here that needed some room to be put up for a day or two, we might do it. What's it mean to do it without grumbling? It means to do it with a sincere desire to do it. As John had said earlier in 1 John, that we are to love one another in brotherly love. When we, love, when we do these things, when we act out the love of Christ amongst the brethren, we do these things because we love the family of God. Locally, and for those that might come from afar and supporting those that are afar, we do it without grumbling. Gaius also understood the possibilities of verses like Hebrews 3.12, or 3.2 rather, it says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. This verse amazes me in the, in the application. Is it true? Yes, because it's in God's word. You ever met a stranger? Ever talked to somebody on the street? Maybe they were holding a cardboard sign. Maybe they broke down and had a flat tire. Maybe fill in the blank. Somebody that you otherwise had not engaged with, and God gives you an opportunity to serve this person. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. So not only amongst the brethren, but also as an example in the world around us. Because as I've said before, our walk, that the way that we live our lives and how we present ourselves to the world around us is a great testimony of who we are in our identity with Christ. Our application out of this is so, as we're able to do so, we ought to be inviting and supporting speakers of God's word when they come to us. Look at verse 7, it says, John writes, for they went out for the sake of the name. This is where Stan, you know, got a hold of my notes and put all these songs in there, talk, writing about the name of Jesus. Why were these men going out for the sake of the name? Who's the name? The name of Jesus. For the sake of Jesus, they had gone out to share the truth and to be in the towns and sharing the gospel. Maybe these are people that were sharing locally in their own town. Maybe these are people that had gone to far off countries. But the reason that they had gone out is they were motivated to go out and serve God because of the name of Jesus and because of what he had done for them personally. Maybe it's a missionary visiting here. Maybe it's a traveling pastor or a traveling teacher coming through teaching a lesson. Maybe it's a group. Maybe it's a group of performers that comes to town. Evangelists. Whatever they are, they're people that are working in the field. Earlier verses, God said you know, that the, the fields were, were, were ripe. And the only thing we needed were workers to go out into the field. I know when we look at the world around us today and we go, yeah, it's ripe. But there's also a, a, a harvest out there that God is waiting to be collected up because there are people out there that are so desperate for the truth because everything around them is falling apart. And there's only one thing that is true and that can be counted on all the time. Trust in the Lord. And all of us have called, been called to be workers in that field. Verse 8, John says, Therefore we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers in the truth. Notice in verse 7, those that went out were not asking or accepting anything from the Gentiles, as non-believers or, or new believers. It says, as these men went out sharing the gospel for the, name, uh, for the sake of the name, they weren't going out and saying, you know, hey, for 20 bucks I'll share Jesus with you. Get your salvation here, salvation right over here. No, he said, you know, we're not salvation for sale. These people that go out to do the work of the Lord in the field are not doing so for the money, but it costs money to go out. They have to be supported somehow. And he says, then the work that we have is to help support men such as this. And look that he says, he says, so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. I was talking in the, uh, the, uh, my Sunday school class earlier today. I mean, you know, sometimes we elevate the, you know, the person, the namesake, the voice that's out there sharing those things. But that doesn't happen without the support that goes behind it. This doesn't happen without the tech crews that go on up there. This doesn't happen without the crews that take care of the facility. Our missionaries that go out into the fields and sharing the mess message of God, it doesn't happen without support. And so when we support these people, we are a part of that message. You become a part of the salvation of everybody that that person reaches. It takes a team to come together and to put these things on, and we can be a part of that team. 
Jesus taught, whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Matthew 10, 41. When we welcome the, the messengers of the truth into our homes, when we welcome the messengers of the truth in to encourage and equip us for, for ministry, then we're a partaking and part of that blessing as well. So Gaius was a man that was doing it right. Gaius was a guy then that was following in Jesus' footsteps, and Paul, or John rather, is commending him for his, for his work that he is doing. He says that uh, they testify about you. He's got no, no complaints. Well, let's look at the second man here, uh, Diotrephus. Might be a couple different ways to pronounce that. I chose that one. 3 John 1, let's read verses 9 through 11. So after commending uh, Gaius for his good work, he now says in verse 9, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephus, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words and not satisfied with this. Neither does he himself receive the brethren, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church." Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good, the one who does good, is of, is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. As much as Gaius might have been a guy that was doing it right, here's another member of the church, and John takes an issue with him. He says he's a self-promoter, one that desires to be first among men. He's insubordinate in that he's not receiving the teachings that the apostles are sending out, maybe not even receiving them themselves. He's slanderous toward them. He's vindictive. And he says his character serves as a warning for us. He says, he who does evil has not seen God. It seems apparent from the letter that Gaius was a person who would have known uh, both of these other men that are listed in the letter. Maybe they're from the same town. Maybe they're from the same church. But as you read those descriptions of Diotrephus, if you had to say that this man had one thing that was his downfall, what word would it be? Pride. Diotrephus was fighting with his pride. And that can be a problem, especially for those who serve up front. People that are those out front people, like apparently Diotrephus was, have to be very careful to stay very humble before the Lord and that we're using the gifts that we have to serve the Lord. John says he wrote to the church, apparently a letter of instruction. Maybe it was even one of the first two letters. But he says, Diotrephus, wanting to be first among his congregation, refused to accept the content of the letter, refused to accept those teachings. Can you imagine if we were living in those days and the Apostle John wrote a letter to this church to equip us, encourage us, correct us, and the senior pastor and the board of elders said, nah. Now, we're not, you know what? I'm, I'm not bringing that to my congregation. We got it handled. We're okay. We got it. Can you even imagine such a situation? And yet this is exactly what was happening there. And we ought to be careful because, you know, these kind of things can happen in the churches today. Proverbs 15.22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. You may or may not be aware, but here at Wellspring Bible Fellowship, we've been going through some trying times. We've been trying to make some big decisions. And so church leadership then, just like now, we've had a lot of things that we're trying to watch over. We're trying to provide sound teaching. We're trying to protect God's truth. We're trying to administer the church and run the church in such a way that God receives the glory and is magnified. We've also been doing that with wise counsel. We've heard from you. We've heard from pastors from other churches. We've heard from organizations like CB Northwest. We are taking in wise counsel. So this is something, as you look at the, at the nature, the character of Diotrephus, here comes a letter from John saying, I bring you this teaching, and he says, don't want nothing to do with it. Can you even imagine? We have tried to approach church leadership with humility. Diotrephus approaches it with pride to protect his church, and in great zeal, he's doing things wrong. Paul writes that not only will he not accept wise counsel, he says he's also spreading malicious gossip about the church, refusing to welcome others who are in the church. And if somebody comes in with a message that doesn't agree with them, not only is he not allowing them into the church, but if you invited them into the church, he says, out with you too. You know what that breeds? Churches with closed doors. I don't believe that we have that kind of an atmosphere here. I hope we never do. But the attitude he had is if you don't believe the way we believe, then you're not welcome here. 
If you have any questions about what we believe, don't bother talking with them, uh, to us about them. Diotrephus only wanted his teaching to be presented and publicly ridiculed others who felt differently. The focus of his glory wasn't in the power of what God had to say, but in the interpretation of what Diotrephus had to say. You see the problem. He was all conviction with no compassion. And I pray that in no way is Wellspring Bible Fellowship ever going to look like that church. It's no wonder when we look down in verse 10 that John says to them that he's going to call them out publicly. He says, when I get there, he says, I'm going to call this man out publicly for the things that he is doing wrong. Verse 11, John says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. I don't think John is saying that Diotrephus is an evil man. I think what he is saying is that Diotrephus is certainly demonstrating evil ways. In his walk, as he professes to be a follower of Jesus Christ, John is calling him out and saying that he's walking poorly and wanting to maybe encourage him to do right, maybe hoping that he will repent and become a better leader. John commended Gaius because he heard from others how Christ-like his walk was, but here he speaks boldly against the walk demonstrated by Diotrephus. I think that when John says, I want to talk and, and call this man out, he said, publicly, I want to talk with him. I think it's two things. One, that he can correct Diotrephus and that he will be a better leader. And two, so that those in his congregation see that they have been, uh, they've been witnessing false teaching or at least a poor walk. to help correct the church as well. That's called discipleship. See, the word basically for discipleship means that you're a follower of something. To be a disciple, rather, means to follow somebody. Discipleship is that act of mentoring that person and bringing them up in the way that they ought to go. John is trying to be a disciple. He's trying to, to disciple Diotrephus and correct his bad teaching, correct his bad ways. Now, we have an opportunity, the way that we approach this then. If you think about it for a moment, you probably know somebody in your circle of friends that isn't walking rightly. We all stumble from time to time, but there are some people that have a habit of walking, maybe from a false pretense, maybe from a false teaching that they picked up somewhere. Maybe it's out of arrogance or pride. First thing I want you to ask yourself is, according to God's word, are you walking rightly? And then second, is there a way that I can be a, a mentor for that person that I know that who is not walking that way? My challenge to you today is to try and decide how you would affect that person's walk. Would it be by improving your own walk to be more like Gaius? Would it be to call them out in their evil ways, as John said, to force their darkness into the light and then to encourage them to walk rightly? Maybe even to step up and be an accountability partner for that person to help them to walk rightly with the Lord. Because seldom do these kind of problems fix themselves. Very seldom does somebody who is walking wrongly suddenly realize, oh, you know what? I am just way lost here, and they fix it all by themselves. Quite often... God sends somebody to point out the error of their ways to them. Be willing to be that somebody. Let's look at that third person here. Let's go to John 3, uh, verse 12. John says, Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself, and we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. The NIV states it this way, Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. More like Gaius, much less like Diotrephus, Demetrius is a guy who people say is doing it well. They say they, that everyone speaks well of him. John says even, even we are speaking well of him. He's contrasting the one who does good as being from God, and he says the one who does evil does not know God. There's 11. So now as he's following up this discussion with, with Demetrius, he says here's a guy who knows God because he's doing well. And not only by his own word, but John says, we have heard it from many others. John encourages Gaius by telling him that Demetrius is not only well spoken of locally, but people are hearing it from wherever John goes. So the message about these people that are doing God's work well gets out. You know that people in your circle of friends know a lot about you. And people that they talk to know something about you. You'll encounter people on the street. They'll say, oh, I've heard of you. And you hope that that's in a good way. <laughs> I mean, throughout, I mean, publicly, I get out in a lot of different areas, not only here, but through law enforcement. And so I, I encounter a lot of people. I get people that come up to me like, oh, hey, you remember me? I'm thinking, from which life? <laughs> 
Was it a traffic stop? Did I meet you in jail? Did, was it, did you go, go to church? Or you get people on me and say, oh, I've heard of you. Again, from which life? <laughs> you hope that our testimony, the, the, the reputation that you have is a good reputation. Again, you're hoping that this peop, the people around us recognize that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And that's what John is saying about, uh, about Demetrius and he's saying it uh, about Gaius is that people say that they know this man, these men and that they know that they are followers of, teach, of Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus said that he, was, that he was the way, and we see that these men are living out that in their own lives. A living testimony. I can stand up here and I can talk to you all day about, about God's word. But if I walk out of these walls and I don't model it outside of these walls, how real is it? In the circle of friends that I interact with and professionally in the job where I'm at, if, if they don't know that I am a Christian, what good does it do God? If I'm only a Christian here in church, if I'm only a Christian as I present the word, if I'm only a Christian in, the, in my Christian circle, what good does that do God's kingdom? I've said that someday if I were ever placed on trial for being a Christian, I hope it is a very short trial. I hope that the evidence against me is overpowering. Let's go and read the final verses here in uh, John 3, his closing John says in verse 12, though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper. I'm on the wrong one. Although he closes out uh, the second letter and the third letter the same, he says, I had so many things to write to you, but I'm not willing to write them to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly and we will, be, and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you, greet the friends by name. It's much in the same way that he finished the second letter. John says, I'm coming to you, and I want to speak with you face by face. I want, there's things I could write to you, there's so much I want to say, but I'll wait till I get there so we can talk about it in person. Where's my small group people? Anybody in a small group, a midweek group that gets together? There's levels of church. When we get up here and we do the, the presentations from the pulpit, that's what it is. Preaching is a presentation out to the audience. When we get together and we do our Sunday school classes, our adult education classes, there's more interaction there. If you're involved in a small group, it's nothing but interaction, and the growth that occurs in small groups is tremendous. The opportunity to, to tie into one, another, another, one another's lives and to build relationships there. God doesn't want us just approaching the word and the word alone. He wants us to have relationships with each other. He wants us to be growing. Again, our walk all started somewhere. My guess is that you probably did not start your walk off as the complete Christian that you are today. We're all working that direction, and it's a process. So let me ask you this. From these three men, from Gaius and Diotrephus and Demetrius, we see that John's encouragement was to walk rightly, not just before the Lord, but in such a way that our walk would be seen by the world around us. The question to you is this. Which one of these men are you? Are you a Gaius, living rightly, demonstrating God's love and hospitality and support of those who have gone out in the name of the Lord? Are you a Gaius, a person that you know, people look at and go, wow, you know what, I, we have a need for somebody to be, for hospitality and outreach. And we need, are you the person that has that open door policy at your house? Yeah, you know what, I'm, I'm able to support that. We have a missions group, we're gonna be doing something here at the church, and we need some workers to help out with that. Are you the person who has a reputation where people know that they can come and get help from you for that? In the world around you, are you well known as being a follower of the teachings of Jesus Christ? Are you a Gaius? Are you a Diotrephus? I believe what I believe. I know what I believe. If you believe anything else, nothing to do with you. Well, I'd like to discuss it. I have nothing to say to you. Are you a closed-door Christian that says that your way is the only way, and anybody that wants to try and debate or discuss these things with you, you'll not even make time for is church a members-only club? Or do we have open doors to allow people to come in and to hear the truth? Do you realize that some people that walk through the doors of this church are not saved? I know. They, there are people that walk in. There may be somebody sitting in the auditorium today that is here to hear just what it is that we have to say about this person, Jesus Christ, 
and has not accepted Jesus as their personal Savior. There may be one of those people here today. I might be sitting right next to you. Careful, look around. If you see somebody that's sitting next to you that you don't recognize for having been here for more than about three or four weeks, like one of those newcomer type people, say hi. <laughs> we want to be an open door church that welcomes people in to hear the truth. They're going to come in from different backgrounds. They're going to come in with different belief systems. They're going to come in seeking the truth. They took the time to come here. They're seeking something. Let's let them in, let's welcome them in, and let's be instructors and teachers for them to help mentor and guide them to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. There might even be a sinner or two here, I know, right? Oh boy. I, sinners in church, I know, it's crazy. Let's not be Diotrephus. Let's not have closed-minded, closed-doors churches. Or are you a Demetrius, one of those people who everyone, again, says is a follower of Jesus Christ, just because of the way that you live. Do they speak well of you saying, yeah, you know what, that person, yeah, they're, 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 they're a follower of Jesus. Are you one of those persons when you walk into the break room and they're telling a dirty joke that they shut up? I love it when that happens. I love it when I'm sitting in my office and somebody is having a personal, you know, something has gone wrong in their life, and they come into me and they say, hey, can I, can I ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. I know that I know that you're you know that you pray and you're you go to church stuff. So would you pray for me? I had that happen this week. I thought, wow, that's cool. That this person come, knew that I was a person who would pray for them. I love it when that happens. If I went out to your circle of friends and said, Did you know that person went to church this week? And they went, Really? <laughs> was it struck by lightning? Everybody is someone. My question is, who are you? Your families are watching, your children are watching, your kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, great-great-great-grandkids. The whole world is watching. God's watching. The question is, who are you? I want you to take a step back. I want you to look at your life from afar. Just one step out of, out of your own person and look at your life. Don't ask who you think you are. What I want to know is I want you to ask myself, who do others say that I am, because that's your testimony among men. Take control of your walk. Let Jesus be your guide. If you're not the kind of person that people would look at and say, wow, that's a follower of Jesus Christ right there, ask yourself, why not? Why is it not apparent? Not to the glory of you, but when the world sees you as a Christian, then that's the glory of God. Because hopefully that walk is something that looks like Jesus' walk. And if you're stepping wrongly in that walk and you know you're doing things that people look at and go, wow, if that's Christianity, I want nothing to do with it, then we need to adjust our walks. Because just like little Craig told the pastor that the lament was boring and then went home and set the neighbor's field on fire, <laughs> you can change your walk. We can perfect our walk when we study God's word, when we're in connection with one another and serving the body in brotherly love, we can have a walk that looks like Jesus Christ and be a powerful, living testimony to what he has done for us. Let's pray. Father God, as we, uh, as we take hopefully this message home with us out of the church today, I hope that we look at the examples that were given to us and we ask ourselves, you know, who am I? Who do others say that I am? When you ask Peter that question, he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When people look at us and they look at me, who do people say that I am? Do they realize that I am a child of God? Do they realize that I've been born again? Do they realize that I am forgiven? Do they realize that you, Lord, are my God? Do they see things in my life that look like acts of brotherly love? Do they see self-control? Do they see all the spiritual gifts that we, that we read about in, our, in the Bible. Are we modeling that to the world around us? God, I ask for each one of us hearing this word today and at home that we would look at our lives and ask, them, ask ourselves quite honestly, am I living out my faith in such a way as to make you look upon me as your child and go, yeah, that one's mine. 
Lord, we don't want to embarrass you in any way. You have loved us so well and given so much to us that we want our lives to honor you because of what you have done for us. We ask you, Lord, to help us to really look at our lives and clean up our walk to the glory of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.